Welcome back to Golden Rule Radio, your weekly recap of the precious metals markets. And even though we are a couple days early, we're recording on Wednesday, March 29th, we thought it was important to recap the quarter a little bit. And in brief, before we dig into uh, the metals and the charts a little bit more deeply, gold is finishing up the quarter right now at 8% up, silver down 2%. Platinum's down almost 8%, and palladium is down 15%, the loss leader there in the physical metals. And so, Miles, let's kind of, starting with gold, do a little bit deeper dive on these charts. Yeah, definitely. I mean, kicking off with gold, obviously, it's been a pretty volatile couple weeks, I think is fair to say. But if you stretch your timeline out a little bit, and we go back to, say, If we were doing a six-month review and not a uh, three-month review, obviously gold has been climbing relatively strongly up from 1,600, low 1,600s back in September all the way to pushing to 2,000 again here in the last week. So we've had a pretty strong move up in gold, a little bit of volatility here. But yeah, it is nice to see that it's starting to trend upwards again after this lull that we've had over the last couple of years. Markets, especially the precious metals markets, because they're so heavily influenced just by supply and demand and reaction to what's going on in some of the other markets, that you see these explosive periods in gold that don't last too long. You know, on a grand scale, you get three years of up movement, a year or two of reversal movement, and then we kind of just tread water for a number of years. And then you have this other massive explosion up in gold where you'll eventually will end up and it'll happen again probably we end up finding a top we'll have a little bit of reversal and then we'll have an extended period of kind of sideways trading so and you see that in the shorter term patterns as well you know what you see in the long time frames you also see in the shorter time frames and lo and behold what have we had we've had a pretty explosive move up now in gold in the short term going from 1600 to around 1920 We had a correction back down. Well, now instead of having some sideways trading because of what happened in the banking industry here over the past couple of weeks, we had this explosion back up in gold in a very short period of time. And now it looks like gold might be leveling off somewhere in the mid-1900s, which is what I'd like to see over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I think it's trying to find its place. It's trying to watch and wait a little bit. We say on this show a lot that gold reacts. It's not setting some trend and other markets aren't reacting to what gold is doing. It's the opposite. We started the quarter right around 1820. Here we are right around 1970. So up about $150. That's great price action. And it's an indication of what gold does in periods of uncertainty, right? It can be uncertainty in the equities markets. It can be uncertainty in the currency. It can be uncertainty, obviously, in the banking system with the recent crisis. It can be uncertainty in any number of markets, even real estate. So doing what it should do. And some people would call this a sea rise too. Technically, I mean, have you seen with this pause, have we broken the trend or are we still technically in more of that bullish pattern starting from back in September? No, I think we're definitely still in the bullish pattern. We came into what could be a little short-term top. So if you take the bottom we put in back, say, in around August of 2021, and then the bottom again we just put in in September of 2022, and you draw a trend line and then just drag that trend line up, you have a little parallel trading pattern here, which we peaked out back in around February, March of last year following obviously the Ukraine crisis. And we just came into that same declining trend line here again. So it of course is possible after all the upwards movement and RSI divergence and extending beyond moving averages and so on and so forth, at least on a short term, I think it's likely we see one of two things happen if we're talking about normal trading. We could sit sideways here in a very tight channel. 20, 30 bucks up and down, shake out some of the panic buying, and then move above this declining trend line. Well, now all of a sudden we're back in the 2000s. And there's really nothing in previous trading between 2000 and the old highs. So if we see a move like that, you're talking gold at 2300, 2400 before we hit the next high and then follow that pattern I was talking about earlier, where you have this explosive move up, 
you have it top out, find a little bit of a reversal, and then sort of sit sideways for a while. But if we're following the Elliott wave theory and we are looking at a C wave increase, which is very likely, the length of the C wave exceeds the length of the A wave. Well, we've done the math on that, and that puts you at a bare minimum in the 2300s. Now, that's not a unreasonable thing to expect given some of the other stuff we're going to look at when we get to the equities market and we start looking at some of the bond yields and we know where the interest rates are going and all of it. Yeah, we've almost given up. I mean, we've given up as of this week, two thirds, maybe a little bit more of the uh, U.S. Central Bank buying or the decrease in the U.S. Central Bank buying. It's amazing to me that the second something bad happens, we find a way to just print our way out of it. That's right. The spigots open up again. Well, silver has not necessarily mirrored gold. It's remained strong. I'm actually encouraged by silver. We're sitting at 2342 as we record here today, but we started the year at 2386 or so. And so that actually means we're down 1.9% as of recording. But with recent price action, I mean, certainly we were lower than that. And we'll get into the ratio here in just a little bit, but what are the charts telling you on silver? Yeah, well, silver, the volatility is always going to be higher or at least more aggressive. I mean, sure, silver, if you pick the beginning of the quarter to where we are now at the end of the quarter, uh, it doesn't look quite as good as gold. But if you go back again, you go back to where gold started back in September to now, and then you look at where silver was back in September to now, we're from 17 to 23. Yeah, huge gains. Yeah, it's a pretty significant gain. And we've been as high as 25 back at the 2022 end of the year in December. So silver is way more volatile. The reversal we had between September and December was completely in line with normal trading. And like you said, gold seems to be peaking out here, at least for the short term, but silver just keeps chugging along. I think silver is going to get overbought. Uh, it's already starting to look a little bit overbought. It wouldn't surprise me to see a little bit of a retracement here in silver, just given what's happened in the last month. I mean, 19 to 23 in a month is pretty significant. But other than that, yeah, I think silver looks really strong. Yeah, these differences in their price actions really are, again, are another example of how gold is more of the money metal than silver is. Yes. And so that's what and we're And the seeing emotional here. metal. Absolutely. And globally, it's so much easier to position in with large dollars. So you do see some gold strength. And what happens in that instance? Now, we started the year at a gold to silver ratio of about 76 to 1. Today, we're 84, but we're coming down. So, you know, obviously that's higher, that's eight points higher than where we started the year, but we were 91 to one just a few weeks ago. And we've come down seven points because in the short term here, in the last couple of weeks, silver has actually outperformed gold. And that's why I feel good about it. That's why I'm pleased with where it is. But we're watching that ratio. If we do see that silver correction that you're talking about and gold is acting like the money metal and it stays in this tight channel that you describe, I really could see that ratio climbing back towards the 90. And when that happens, obviously, that just means that it's pointing to an even more undervalued silver. But that goes to show what you're saying. Right. The volatility in silver is what swings the ratio, too. Well, and what concerns me with silver is two things. A, anybody who's buying silver out there right now knows that spot price doesn't mean anything in the physical market. You know, I used to joke and say spots just kind of the mercury in the thermometer. It sort of tells you what the temperature of the market is. It's not even true anymore. I mean, it's not even close compared to what the cost of actual silver is costing out in the open market. And then the second thing that concerns me with trying to, and when I say concern, I'm talking about kind of like trying to dance around these price movements and trying to turn silver and gold into speculative investment metals, which is not the way you want to approach the precious metals market. Because if you look back at when we had the derivative bubble and the credit default swaps and the margin calls on all of these positions in 2008, it drug gold down with it to the 600s. So gold had a pretty significant move, 660 to 2000 almost over the course of a couple of years. Yeah, 150%. Silver tripled in nine months. Right. So it comes out of nowhere at the tail end of the market when nobody's paying attention to it. And what makes me nervous about that is if you're spending your time trying to dance around and pick and choose the accurate best possible price that you can in a runaway market, you're never going to get in. 
and it's too late at that point. So in a volatile market like this where, you know, we've joked about this in the past. I mean, there are periods of time where looking at a chart and expecting markets to act in a natural, healthy way can just get thrown out the window. And if we're coming into a period of time like that, and we've seen little glimpses of it, this past month was certainly a little glimpse of it, because you see what ends up happening in the world when a couple decent-sized banks face significant liquidity problems. So what's the next crisis that ends up causing people to mad rush to the doors? I don't know. And how is the precious metals market, which has historically been the traditionally stable asset that you can fall back on in times of crisis, how's it going to respond to that and what's the availability going to be? Well, that's the issue. And you and I have the history of working here in 2008 into 2009, 10, and 11 as we saw those price actions, those huge swings as a result of, again, uncertainty in the markets, unpredictability, obviously utter chaos. It feels similar subjectively here. If this banking issue continues to unravel, if it continues to reflect this systemic sickness in the banking industry, well, then we could be seeing that, right? So you're right. Silver at that point did more than a triple in 2009 to 2011 when it hit its $50 high. Well, that's 115% from where we currently sit. Right. Gold, we're sitting above the all-time high that it set back in 2011. So which has more room to run? Obviously, it's the silver, and proportionately, we've seen that. Well, imagine what numbers we're talking about if gold just goes up 100% from here, conservatively, in a repeat of these cycles. Well, you know, now you're looking at $3,800 gold, which really is kind of almost where it should be priced already. So don't be surprised by large numbers because there's more money in the system. Platinum and palladium are telling us that the economy is sick, in my opinion. Yeah, They're pointing agree. towards recession, depression, and platinum down 8%, palladium down 15%. We've been on the right side of the fence recommending the platinum, but they're not going to go anywhere. That's a sideways channel that we could see remain, could we not, as long as the recessionary woes and even realities remain. Yeah, of course. I mean, I still want to have a 5 or 10% of my metals position staked in platinum Absolutely. personally. Yep. I don't care if it is moving alongside gold or if it's three years from now that it plays catch up. That's not relative to me because I don't want to have a big position in it. I'm a gold owner. I'm a platinum investor. Those are different things. And I like buying things when they're cheap and I'm patient. But my gold position, I'm buying every two weeks. Like I don't care what the price is. I've got money going into my vaulted account every two weeks. Yep. And oil is telling us sort of the same thing. It's down 10% this quarter. Right. You know, and we can talk about the equities. They've actually done the opposite. They've had quite the rally. U.S. dollar is now at an eight-week low. We're waiting to see what happens with that 101 level, but we're at 102.6. So just to recap the dollar and oil this quarter, 2% down in the U.S. dollar index, 10% down in oil that makes you feel pretty good about what gold does as the money metal in this quarter. Like news recap wise, you've had rate hikes continuing. Obviously, you've had that dollar down showing weakness, the equities rallying, which Miles, I want you to touch on. Obviously, the banking crisis here and central bank buying continues. And we've got the BRICS looking to somehow kill the U.S. dollar. Uh, there's a concerted effort to come against the dollar as a world reserve currency but the equities have done pretty well. Let's recap those. Sure. I mean, relative to the quarter, I'd completely agree with you. We'll start with the dollar. The dollar actually has severely disappointed me. Um, I, I really, Bad dollar. Yeah, I really <laughs> wanted to see if we could rally up to like 107, 108, and we definitely I could, but we stopped at a very shallow retracement, just the 382 FIB retracement at about 105 and change a little under 106, and we've been back down since then. We're still above the low for the year, which is down at around 100.8 but not too much above it. So maybe the dollar starts stair-stepping up. It's hard because the country keeps announcing more and more spending bills. Right. And we're raising interest rates. So the government's now borrowing at substantially higher interest rates. You and I are now borrowing at substantially higher. I mean, the prime rate's at eight. Well, and it's not just the debt. You know, it's the response 
to like the banking crisis. That money into the FDIC that's clearly underfunded comes from the Federal Reserve, mm-hmm. which is balance sheet, which is money printing out of thin air. And even though they're saying that they're trying to shrink the balance sheet, it's not going to happen. We fully expect there to be either a Fed pause or a necessary cut, but certainly an increasing of the balance sheet if this continues to unwind circa 2008, 9, 10, 11, 2020, 2021. <laughs> You know, right. it goes on. Well, and the U.S. central balance sheet managed to go between about March of last year, where we peaked out, just under $9 trillion. They did unwind it up until the beginning of March down to about $8.3 trillion. They at least put a divot in it, but we're back up to 8.7. So they've gotten all of the work that they put in over the last year. In the course of two weeks, they've given up two-thirds of it. That's right. But what effect has it had on the stock market? Uh, none. I mean, the stock market continued to fall. We've had a bounce the last couple of days. Again, starting with January 1st compared to now, maybe the numbers don't look so bad if you're looking at MSNBC uh, and they're trying to tell a story. But if you actually look at the highs and lows interim between January 1st and today, or we go back to September. I don't know what it is well, about September. Fair, yeah, that's when everything sort of Yeah, when pivoted. everything bounced. I mean, we go from under 29,000 on the Dow all the way up to almost 35. That was a heck of a move. But I've pointed this chart out ever since the beginning of the year. The first high was higher than the second. The second high was higher than the third. And then lo and behold, we get a banking issue and it just sort of drops off the cliff. We've had a bounce over the last couple of weeks. That's great. I wonder who paid for that U.S. Central Bank. Thank you. Appreciate that. That's why I asked the question. Yeah. (laughs) But there's nothing in the U.S. economy that tells me that the stock market has any long-term legs in it whatsoever. And nobody believes it does. I'm not like the weirdo out in the woods hollering at the moon here. Like nobody thinks the U.S. stock market has any strength whatsoever going forward. Nobody thinks the U.S. economy does. And that's why Jerome Powell is being very clear. They're purposefully trying to slow the job market and slow the economy in order to slow the pace of inflation. I don't understand what people aren't getting and why they're out there speculating unnecessarily in the equities markets. At some point, there's going to be great value in that market sector. It isn't right now. The proof has got to be in the pudding, and that's going to be when all of these policies end up reverting back to the easy money policy. And the interest rate policy seems pretty locked in. I mean, you've got the one-year treasury yield at about 4.6, and you've got the 30-year down at 3.7, the 10-year down at 3.5. Your short-term rates are a percent higher than your long-term rates. This is where I'm missing the disconnect. But I don't understand how we can be in an environment where nobody trusts the direction of the U.S. stock market, which everybody knows has been propped up on central bank buying for a number of years now, and low interest rates. And now that interest rates are starting to rise, our short-term yields are exceeding our long-term yields because nobody thinks that they're going to stick with the plan of raising interest rates long term. And I don't understand how you can think both of those things are true. The stock market's going down because we're in crisis. Maybe it's just because they think that they're going to give up the ghost and go back to just full bore inflation again to save the problem. I just don't know. I don't know what the average bobblehead on national news TV that gets to sit at the U.S. Fed Reserve meetings every month and ask the same stupid punch bowl question over and over again. I don't see what plan they see in their head that they're trying to get Jerome Powell to agree to. Well, what concerns me greatly, too, is this is different, this go round. You have brokerage firms that now are banks, that own banks. They're absorbing banks like UBS Mm -hmm. absorbing Credit Suisse. You have banks buying brokerage firms. You have brokerage firms and banks owning insurance companies. So now there's this interconnectedness. Yeah, that's right. There's this interconnectedness that that doesn't lend stability. What it means is that one unraveling has much greater ripple effects. Now you're across industries, across sectors, and it has a far more toxic effect when you have a major failure. We've seen large regional banks fail as of late. We have not had a large brokerage firm fail that might own a bank or own insurance companies. And that to me is where you get the unwinding of the derivatives market. And that to me is why you own physical gold in hand. 
and Janet Yellen handpicking who gets to break the rules and who doesn't. So I agree with you. I don't know what you do right now. Besides, if you've got a mortgage and the rate is locked in, hang on to it. I'll sit on my 3% mortgage. I think that's just great. And if you can manage to get in a consistent small buying pattern of precious metals on a regular basis for the indefinite future, I think that's the best thing you can do too. So that's going to do it this week for Golden Rule Radio. As always, we appreciate you stopping by. If you liked what you heard, you can head on over to our website at McIlvaney.com to learn more about us and how we work with our clients in building a strategic precious metals portfolio that fits your life. You can also find more about us. We're on Facebook at McIlvaney Financial, and we're on Twitter at ICA Gold. Better yet, give us a buzz. Talk to one of the advisors here about your personal precious metals portfolio. We can be reached at 800-525-9556. Thanks for listening. Have a great week.